Uh, my name's Wayne Hoff. I'm a member here at, uh, at First Lutheran, and uh, I'm very privileged and very happy to be able to bring you the message. Of course, that op opportunity comes to me because uh, Pastor Kevin can't really be here since we're doing the vote. Um, we don't need him kind of hovering around us like, uh, like Trump behind Clinton or something like that. <laughs> Um, I want to say thank you. That was a kind of a bad joke, wasn't it? I, I want to say thank you um, both to Tiffany for that spectacular uh, introduction. I don't really need to preach, uh, but I guess I will anyways. Uh, and, and to the band. Um, I, I, I really love this song, and there's, there's a kind of a paradox within this song. Uh, and uh, you did such a good job, because I kind of felt, I, I got emotional the same I did the first time I heard that song. Uh, and when I, the first time I heard it, my very first thought was, poor Superman. I just never thought about it that way before. Um, and so there's this melancholy that just rips through that song and tugs at the heart. But at the same time, it's, it's silly. I mean, it's almost absurd. We're talking about comic book characters after all, right? So, uh, Superman, Tarzan, Solomon Grundy, which is a big hulk of a, of a villain uh, that fought against folks in the DC universe. Um, if you get a chance, go on YouTube and watch the, the video for this song as well, because it, it emphasizes that kind of uh, uh, um, juxtaposition of the silly and the serious. Um, the, when, when you see it, you have the lead singer, uh, um, Brad Roberts, uh, Canadian band, by the way, who sings from the church lectern, much like I am here now, and you have one pew of people in the front, and it's a funeral, you realize, and it's like uh, the lead singer's delivering the eulogy. And the folks uh, in the front row, they're wearing dirty suit jackets that only partly hide their own superhero costumes. Uh, but they're advanced in age and slow in their movements and their costumes are quite dirty and used. So under that plaintive baritone of uh, Roberts that you captured so well, Pete, uh, the song takes on a gravity that hides beneath its form as a pop song. And maybe that's because it opens up a question that we tend not to ask of any of our superheroes. Why don't you just walk away? Why don't you just choose an easier life? In our scripture reading today, Paul raises questions in quite a similar tone. There's a silliness to it. I am speaking as a fool, he cries, and I'm out of my mind to be saying this. But of course, there's something very serious about it too. He's not lying, after all. He really did suffer those things. Prison, flogging, shipwrecks, and, and lots more. And then Paul raises a wholly unnatural paradox. When I am weak, then I am strong. What does that mean? God's power is made perfect in weakness, he says. What does that mean? How can power come out of weakness? Well, Scripture provides many examples of power revealed in weakness. And I think we see it in three ways. First, in creation. Um, you know, we, we have the creation of the universe and all the glory of that. But what's the most important day out of the seven days of creation? It's the seventh day, the Sabbath, the day that we rest, the day that God rests. Uh, we see it uh, in the Creator. God is revealed to Elijah, not in the strong wind, not in the earthquake, not in the fire, but in the still, small voice. And that is how God is revealed to Elijah. And finally, we see uh, the power of God revealed through weakness in the created, in folks like you and me. And here we have many, many examples. Uh, God promises Abraham and Sarah a child, even though they're both a hundred years old. They don't believe it themselves, and yet through them God provides not only children, but an entire nation uh, through which uh, Jesus is born. Uh, another example, God tells the prophet Hosea to marry a prostitute of all people. And in this strange union, they showcase very powerfully just how badly the nation of Israel had forsaken its vow. We have David, a shepherd boy, who slays Goliath, a soldier and a monster of a man, a kind of a Solomon Grundy. 
Today is Reformation Sunday, where we remember the actions of Martin Luther and others to steer the church back to a theology of salvation by grace instead of by works. And indeed, uh, Martin Luther was himself a simple monk among thousands of monks, nothing to mark him as particularly uh, special except that God called him to lead a movement through the gifts of his stubbornness, his solidarity with the common person, and a seeming love of controversy. And he was up against an incredibly powerful political and religious authority. We celebrate that movement today, 499 years later. It was 499 years ago that Luther nailed those 95 theses onto the door of the Wittenberg Church. We're one year shy of 500 years uh, since the Reformation. And um, it, it's, a, it's a big day. There's lots of things celebrated, and uh, we're looking forward to that because it's not often we get to celebrate 500 years for something. Um, I have to say the ELCIC, our synod within the Lutheran Church, is planning four big goals as we lead up to that celebration one year from today. Um, they are, uh, there's four goals, 500 refugees sponsored, 500 scholarships to Lutheran students in the Holy Land, 500,000 trees planted, and $500,000 raised for the Lutheran World Federation Endowment Fund. These are fantastic goals, and they are powerful goals, and they're achieved by ordinary folks like you and me. These are all examples of God's power revealed in weakness. But it's not really quite enough because God doesn't say, my power is revealed in weakness. God says to Paul, my power is made perfect in weakness. That's, that's a little bit more. Superman's service to the planet Earth is most laudable, not because he uses his superpowers for the sake of good, although that's great, but no, it's because he maintains this secret identity in a normal workaday job. This is what Tiffany was referring to. If I had Superman's powers, my temptation would be, hey, the sky's the limit. I could be the ruler of the world. I really could break into any bank in the world I wanted to. Who would stop me? There's nobody. Even if I had stronger scruples than that, I might at best choose a life, a secret life of leisure, perhaps earning money playing high stake poker. And with my x ray eyes, I could, I'd be on top of everything. Nobody the wiser. The temptation for Superman must have been almost unbearable given his frequently thank, thankless efforts and changing clothes and dirty old phone booths. What a life! In an interview earlier this year, Brad Roberts, the lead singer, said, Superman's song seems to have touched a nerve with Canadians. And I think it has a great deal to do with Clark Kent's tirelessness in the face of anonymous drudgery. Superman is not recompensed for his actions and he enjoys little personal glory because he must keep his identity secret. Perhaps most importantly, Robert says, it is within his power to be a tyrant, but he opts not to. It is within his power to be a tyrant, but he opts not to. I think that that is the greater revelation in Paul's rant here to the Corinthians. Power is most powerful not when it is exercised, but ironically when it's restrained. Paul was a Jew among Jews, a citizen of the empire, and truly destined for greatness. Then God called him. And perhaps you've heard this story. God confronts him on the road to Damascus. He strikes him with blindness and confusion. Instead of making Paul greater, God makes him weak. Superman has often been called a messianic figure, and I did look this up. It was not the intention of the, of the creators, also Canadian, by the way, um, but it, it, that comparison is very difficult not to make. He comes from afar as a baby, raised by human parents, born to save the world from evil, living a secret identity, showing many signs and wonders. And maybe this comparison isn't surprising because Jesus is the ultimate manifestation of power made perfect in weakness. 
Jesus empties himself of the fullness of his deity to be born a human being on earth. And if that wasn't enough, he lives as a poor man, a citizen of a country occupied by foreign armies and cruel foreign armies. He finally suffers and dies a torturous death. And we have to ask the question, how is God's power made perfect in that weakness? But we know the answer to that. It's that a 12-year-old boy held an entire synagogue captive with his words. It's that a humble carpenter stymied the religious authorities in his day. It's that Jesus stood up to the most powerful empire of the world. It was power shown not in displays of power as we think of it, but in displays of kindness, of healing, of forgiveness, of kindness to the fringes of society, to women, the infirm, the elderly, and sinners, of healing to lepers and to the blind and even to those already dead, and of forgiveness to tax collectors like Zacchaeus and disciples and leaders and women caught in adultery. And of course, it's that after all this, Jesus arose to new life, and even then, not in trumpet fanfares and announcements delivered across the empire by the king's royal messengers, but first by a woman to disbelieving men, and then by formerly timid disciples to the rest of the world. Um, because it's Reformation Sunday today, Pete said, we want to sing A Mighty Fortress Is Our God, and I, it's Luther's great triumphant hymn. He wrote the... Uh, the words and the music, and I heartily agreed. It's a hymn of God's power and might. But we don't sing this hymn because, you know, God can strike, uh, you know, people with bolts of lightning and that sort of thing. That's not the power that Luther talks about in that song. We sing it out loud and proud as a testament to God's power, again, made perfect in weakness. God fights by our side, Luther writes, because Jesus walked on the dirt of this planet just as we do, by our side. Um, he, uh, he continues, with weapons of the Spirit, with reference to that full armor of God. And what is the full armor of God? It's the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the shoes of the gospel of peace, the sword of the Spirit. This is the real power of God. In his earthly ministry, Jesus met people where they needed them, uh, where they needed him. He met religious leaders in the synagogue, tax collectors in their homes. Again, we just heard the story of Zacchaeus in our kids' story. He met the poor on the streets. Nothing has changed. Jesus' earthly ministry continues today, and he still meets us where we need him. In us, God's power is made perfect in weakness, and our weakness takes on many forms. Perhaps we are looking for a new job or looking for a more suitable job, especially these days. Maybe expenses are exceeding income and we're not sure how to turn that around. Perhaps our relationships with family are strained or even broken. Perhaps the last checkup with the doctor did not come with good news, but with some unwelcome news. We don't know the answers to those problems. What we do know from the Gospels is that God stands behind, beside those who suffer and that God's power is revealed in those who suffer. And we don't know the hows or the whys, but God heals illness and relationships and provides comfort to the grieving and to the troubled today, just as Jesus did 2,000 years ago. In the death of loved ones, we mourn, but we do not despair because Jesus has broken the power of death by dying and rising again. The opposite side of the coin applies here as well because we also have occasion to exercise power ourselves. We might use a secret that we know about a friend against them or speak that comment at work that makes you feel bigger by making someone else feel smaller or withhold a kindness that is in your power to give. It is within Superman's power to be a tyrant, but he opts not to. God's love is revealed in us when we refuse to use the power that we have in harsh ways. God's power is made perfect when instead of using a secret against someone, we offer them support and comfort and forgiveness. When we can make a comment that belittles someone else, even when sometimes it seems they deserve it, 
we don't, and instead give a word of encouragement. In the song, Brad Roberts sings that he despairs that he will never again see someone like Superman. On the day that Jesus died on the cross, I can imagine the disciples huddled in a hidden room, despairing that they would never ever again see another man like Jesus. But of course they did. They saw Jesus again, alive and well, victorious over the forces of evil and victorious over death. And so the melancholy of Superman's song gives way to the celebration of our risen Lord, a mighty fortress, and God's power made perfect in weakness. Amen.